Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruh, wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina, wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu fala mudillala, wa man yudhilhu fala hadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun taqullaha haqqa tuqatih. ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا My dear brothers and sisters in Islam When our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم migrated from مكة مدينة he entered in upon a city where the majority of its inhabitants were still non-Muslim. We need to understand, many of us, when we think of Medina, we think of an entire Islamic society. Yes, that was the case at that end. But when he entered the city, perhaps 15, maximum 20% were Muslim. The majority of the city was a non-Muslim city when he entered it. And when he entered the city, the people were expecting him waiting to see, who is this man? What is his message? What is he teaching? There was excitement, suspense building. And one of the people who were there narrated to us the very first, uh, very first hadith or khutbah or lecture he gave as soon as he entered the city of Medina. One of the people who were there was the chief rabbi of Medina, Yahudi, a chief rabbi. And his name is Abdullah ibn Salam. And Abdullah ibn Salam, at the time he was a Yahudi, and he was expecting the Prophet to come. And he wanted to check, is this the same Prophet that Musa predicted? Is this the one we're waiting for or not? So he, as a, as a Jew, is amongst the first people to greet the Prophet wasallam. And he narrates to us this beautiful, this beautiful hadith, which will be the topic of my short talk today. The hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, and it is authentic. And he says, I was amongst the first people who greeted the Prophet ﷺ when he entered the city of Medina. And as soon as I saw him, I recognized that his face was not the face of a liar. Abdullah ibn Salam accepted Islam by looking at the face of the Prophet ﷺ. Before the Prophet ﷺ even opened his mouth, the beauty, the majesty, the spiritual light that Allah had gifted the Prophet ﷺ with, it affected people of ikhlas and sincerity. And Abdullah ibn Salam was a sincere person. He was a, sinc he was a sincere person looking for the truth. And we as Muslims believe that there is a type of perception, a spiritual perception. The Arabic term for it is firasa. And firasa means you can detect something call it a sixth sense or an intuition. Those people with Iman and Taqwa, they have some. And people sometimes, they meet another person and something is going on in, in their minds that this person, there's something not right about him. This is what we call Firasa. And according to our religion, this is an Islamic concept. The more Iman and Taqwa you have, the more correct your Firasa is. And Abdullah ibn Salam had this Firasa. And by looking and gazing at the beauty of the Prophet he converted. Who amongst us can claim that somebody converted to Islam by looking at him other than Rasulullah So Abdullah ibn Salam basically converted looking at the Prophet Then he says, the first words that he spoke were this. So this was the first called a khutbah, called a hadith, called a khatira, the first advice that he gives when he enters the city of Medina. And what was his advice? Ayyuhan nas, أَفْشُ السَّلَامِ وَتُطْعِمُ الطَّعَامِ وَصِّلُ الْأَرْحَامِ وَصَّلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ تَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ بِسَلَامِ Four commandments followed by one prediction. One blessing, four commandments. O mankind, notice he's not saying O Muslims. He's entering in a city where a majority of the people are non-Muslim. O mankind, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ 
The message of Islam is not just for the people in this room. The message of Islam is not just for me and you. Ayyuhan Nas, this is what I'm calling you to. Oh people, this is my message to you. And he mentioned four things. Now listen to me carefully. Each one of these four things represents something bigger than you. It's not just these things. Each one is a pillar. And together, these pillars open up the big room. Each one of these four is an indication for a far bigger aspect of our lives. Now, what are these four things? O oh, people, O oh, mankind. Number one, Afshu salam spread the salam. Number two, Tut'imu ta'am, feed the hunger. Number three, Silul al-Ham, be good to your family. Number four, Sallu bin Layli wa nasu niyam, pray at night when everyone is asleep. If you do these four things, I guarantee you that the Khulun al Jannata be salam. You will enter Jannah in salam and peace. So, what are these four things and what does each one represent? Number one, spread the salam. Spread the salam here means spread the greetings of salam. Say salam wherever you go. Say salam. Now, what does that mean? Say salam. Remember, I said each one of these four indicates something bigger than. Each one of these is the key that opens the door to something that is much greater than. So number one, spreading the salam indicates perfecting your akhlaq, your ethics, your, your manners with one another. Why? Because how do we begin and how do we end any interaction with another human being? We begin and end with the salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As soon as we meet somebody, we begin salam. And when, we, when you're leaving, you end with salam. By the Prophet saying the salam, by saying perfect the salam, spread the salam, make sure you say it and you mean it. What this indicates is your, your akhlaq, your ethics, your, your interactions with, with other people, they have to be based on salam. And spreading the salam doesn't just mean assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. No, it means saying it and meaning it. Saying it and acting upon it. What does assalamu alaikum even mean? Do we even know that? Assalamu alaikum is a statement of fact and it is a dua and a mention of the names of Allah. All three in one. It is a statement of fact. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May no harm and evil touch you. So, statement of fact, I'm not going to harm you because I'm wishing for you salam. <coughs> How can I say assalamu alaikum and at the same time with my hand, with my tongue, with my manners, how can I harm you? What type of salam is this? How can I say assalamu alaikum and then backbite you? How can I say assalamu alaikum and then myself cause you harm? And I just said assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So assalamu alaikum is a statement of fact that I'm not going to harm you. It's also a dua. Assalamu alaikum. May no harm ever touch you. I don't want what's best for you. I don't want you to suffer and be in pain. My happiness is your happiness, and your happiness is my happiness. And it's also mentioning the names of Allah, because one of the names of Allah is As-Salam. So when we say As-Salamu Alaikum, we're also saying, May Allah, who is As-Salam, be watching over you. May Allah, who is As-Salam, be protecting you. May Allah, who is As-Salam, bless you with Salam. So when we say As-Salamu Alaikum, what we are doing, we're indicating to our brethren, our sisters, we're indicating to anybody that we say salam to, that no harm will come to you from me. And I want only what's good for you. And I make dua to Allah that the best and only the best happens to you. Now, can you imagine if all of society perfected the salam? Where would evil come from? Can you imagine if everyone perfected the salam as our Prophet wasallam had asked? Spread the salam, perfect the salam. If we, if we truly per perfected the salam, there would be no lying, no cheating, no, no, no stealing, no backstabbing, no back... They would all be gone. Because that is what spreading the salam entails. So point number one, monitor your akhlaq, monitor your manners with other people and perfect the salam. And by the way, our Prophet was once asked, Ayyul Islami Afta, whose Islam is the best? Or in our words, which Muslim is the best Muslim? And the hadith goes on, but one of the things that the Prophet said, is the Muslim who says salam to everyone, the one he recognizes and the one he doesn't recognize. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, we have a problem in our modern Muslim world that we only say salam to the ones that we recognize. That shouldn't be the, that that shouldn't be what we're doing. 
We should say salam to everyone. And when you say salam, you say it from the qalb, from the heart, and not from the tongue. You say it and you mean it. Assalamu alaikum. May Allah who is assalam give you salam. Nothing but good. Salam means the absence of harm. So assalamu alaikum, may no harm ever befall you. May no misery, may you never be in pain. So number one, spread the salam. Perfect the salam. Number two, tut'imu ta'am. Feed your food to the hungry. Feed your food to the hungry. Dear brothers and sisters, being a good Muslim is not something that requires selfishness. Being a good Muslim is not a private matter. Being a good Muslim doesn't just mean you go to your home and you go to the masjid and you go back home and you go to the... No! تُطْعِمُ الطَّعَامُ Feed your food to the hungry. Do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, that the first commandments of our religion had nothing to do with salah and zakah and hajj? Do you know that salah became obligatory 13 years after Iqra was revealed? Do you know zakah and siyam became obligatory 15 years after Iqra was revealed? Hajj became obligatory 20 years after Iqra was revealed. I want you to think about that. For more than a decade, those early Muslims are not being told to pray or to fast or to give zakah or, or to go for hajj. Think about it. So then what was Islam? What was Islam without these rituals? Because rituals come later on. Much can be said. But do you know what the second commandment Allah revealed in the Quran was? The first, we all know. Worship Allah alone. Avoid worshiping idols. Right. That's the first commandment. La ilaha illallah. Avoid the false god. Do you know what the second amal, the second command in the Quran that was revealed? Do you know the second aspect of purity of Islam that Allah revealed? Look at the early Meccan surahs. Read the early Meccan surahs. How Allah describes those Muslims who weren't, who weren't obligated to fast or to give zakah or to pray. How does Allah describe them? وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَرَفِقُونَ The believers are those. They give, up, they give up their food even though they love that food. They need that food. They desire that food. They share their food with the beggars, with the orphans, with the prisoners of war. And they say to them, we are giving you this food. Don't thank us. Don't, don't thank us. We don't want your things. We want the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam cannot just be personal rituals. The second pillar of this hadith of war. Remember, I said each one of these represents something bigger than you. This second hadith represents social work. It represents giving back to your communities. It represents standing with the oppressed, feeding the hungry, sponsoring the orphan, helping anybody who is in need. And my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm sorry for being so blunt here, but one of the problems of Western Islam, one of the problems of Muslims living in the West, is that they have neglected this very important pillar of giving back to their own communities. They live selfish, isolated, bubble lives. They don't understand that a part of Islam is to be social. A part of Islam is to feed the hungry. It's to have soup kitchens. It's to do something for your own community, regardless of whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. Hunger is not an Islamic problem. Hunger is a human problem. And if you look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, when this verse came down, there were no Muslim prisoners of war. There were no Muslim yatama, no Muslim orphans. The verse comes down in early Makkah, and majority of the people of Makkah are pagans. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, the believers are those who they give up their own food to these pagans. Because it doesn't matter. Hunger is a human problem. And a hungry child, we don't ask him, are you a Muslim so I can donate to you? Wallahi, what Islam is this? You're going to quiz the child, what is your religion, then I can donate to you? We have an issue, brothers and sisters, that many Western Muslims have failed to do what our Prophet ﷺ did. Which is what? Which is to be compassionate and sympathetic to those in need around them. And because of this, people have misunderstandings about our religion. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. What did he do for those 40 years? 40 years before Iqra came. The first 40 years of life, what was he known for? He was known for being the compassionate, 
the trustworthy. He was known as he was called as Siddiq in Al Amin before anybody called him Al Rasul in Al Nabi. When when Iqra came, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes rushing back to Khadija, Khadija calms him down. What does Khadija say? She says, No, no, by Allah, Allah will never humiliate you. Allah will never cause you to go astray. Why? Number one, you're good to your family. Number two. You feed the hungry. Number three, you take care of the orphans. Number four, you are generous with those who need generosity. Number five, and any time anything good needs to be done in this society, you are at the forefront doing it. Now, who was our Prophet ﷺ being generous to? Muslims? There were no Muslims in his first 40 years of life. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, look at the, Islam, uh, at the rising Islamophobia. Look at the sentiments around us. And understand that if we were following the sunnah, and a part of the sunnah is to care for the compassion of our society, a part of the sunnah is to have soup kitchens in our time, a part of the sunnah is anybody who is downcharted and oppressed, we stand up for their rights. And remember, when you stand up for truth and justice, one of the early points of Islam, say no to racism. And Bilal al-Habashi, Salman al-Farisi, Suhail al-Rumi are all equal to the elite of the Quraysh if they had Iman al taqwa but that wasn't politically correct to say at the time. But truth always prevails. And if we stand up for those whose rights are being transgressed, if we stand up and protect the oppressed, if we stand up for the orphan, for the poor, for those who don't have shelter, yes, it's true, we'll get positive cure. But let me also say one thing. That should not be our goal. That should not be our goal. We will get positive PR, but our goal should be what? إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ For the sake of Allah. And as you see, brothers and sisters, let me be very explicit here. Feeding the hungry is not good PR for Islam. Feeding the hungry is a necessary part of Islam. We do it for the sake of Allah. And the good that happens is a gift from Allah. But we do it for the sake of Allah. One of the first words revealed, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا يَحُبُّ عَلَىٰ طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينِ One of the first words revealed, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, Haven't you seen the one who's rejected the Day of Judgment? Rejected Islam? Rejected Allah? The one who rejects Allah is the one that pushes away the orphan. That is the one who doesn't encourage the feeding of the hungry and poor. Which means what? If you believe in Allah, you will embrace the orphan. If you believe in Allah, you will feed the hungry and the poor. What tut'aim al-ta'am? Social work. The biggest problem of poverty is hunger. So when our Prophet says eliminate hunger, this means that the people who don't have clothes, give them clothes. The people who don't have shelter, give them shelter. People who need anything, you give them that thing. This is a necessary part of Islam. And I'm sorry for being so blunt here. But Wallahi, I feel that we as a community have miserably failed to, uh, 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 living up to the sunnah of the Prophet We all know how he was. And when you compare our communities, well, how far behind are we? So number two, social activism. Number three, Silul Arham. Be good to your family. Fulfill the ties of kinship. How can you be a good human to your colleagues uh, how can you be a good human to your colleagues and co-workers and a bad person at home? Wallahi, it is easy to put on a show of good manners amongst your co-workers. You sit with them three, four, five hours and then you go home. It's easy to pretend to be polite in public. Do you know the real people who know who you are? It's your family. And that is why the Prophet wasallam said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي The best amongst you all is the one who is best to his family. You know, if your loved one genuinely respects and loves you, chances are you're a good person. And if your loved one despises you, when you come home you become a Frankenstein, a monster. Outside you're all cheerful and smiling, but when you come home you become the tyrant. That is your true akhlaq. How can you be good to strangers and nasty to your own family, your immediate family? So. Family is the building block of society. When you make family strong, society is strong. And when family tears down, when family tears down, society tears down. Now, back to this hadith, there are four principles. Number one, 
good akhlaq with everyone. Number two, social activism, giving back to your community. Number three, family. Family. Because society needs good family. And then last, last, but not least, nonetheless, last, personal rituals. Notice in this hadith, where did it come? <laughs> Pray at night when everyone is asleep. You don't have to publicize your ibadah. Pray at night when everyone's asleep. Rituals are important, my dear brothers and sisters, but the Prophet ﷺ emphasized three things before he got to rituals. And then even about rituals, he said the more private, the better. You don't need to show your rituals. You don't need to post on Facebook how many times you pray. No. Private. As much as possible. <coughs> private. It is important, but keep as much as you can in private. And remember, Islam is not only about rituals. What we have done, many of us, we have made Islam only about rituals. We concentrate in the rituals and we ignore the other elements of Islam. Good akhlaq, being honest, having a pure heart, wanting what's good for other people, feeding the hungry, being good family members. These are just as Islamic as the other elements. Please, nobody misunderstand me. Of course it's important for you. Of course we have to fast. In this hadith, it's all there. But remember, there are other things here as well. Why do we jump over the first three and we concentrate on the fourth? Remember what our Prophet ﷺ said that verily a man reaches the place of the one who fasts every day and, and prays all night simply by his good akhlaq. You don't have to be the sawam, awam in order to get to the highest place of Jannah. Islam is a comprehensive way of life. It's not just your ibadah that defines you as a Muslim. It's how you are as a person. It's how you are with your loved ones, with your children. It's how you are in society. All of this is also important when it comes to defining your Islam. And even rituals, the more private, the better it is. Yes, some rituals have to be public. Jumma has to be public. But otherwise, as much as you can do in private, do it in private. And of course, this hadith concentrates on the hajjud. Why? Because the one who perfects the hajjud, he has mastered everything else. Now, have you ever heard of anyone who prays the hajjud, but he doesn't pray the five prayers? No, that's, that's impossible. Have you ever heard of anyone who prays the hajjud, but he doesn't fast during Ramadan? It doesn't work that way. So by mastering the hajjud, you have mastered the ibadah. And that shows us that each one of these four, if you master it, everything else follows. Right? So these are the four things that were mentioned. Number one, good akhlaq with other people. Primary, uh, by spreading the salam. Number two, social activism through feeding the hungry. Number three, being good to your family. And number four, personal ibadat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do these four things, what did our Prophet ﷺ say? I guarantee you, you shall enter Jannah in salam, in peace. And this hadith is called the Hadith of Salam. This is called the Hadith of Salam. Why? Because it was narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam. It begins with Salam and it ends with Salam. Spread the Salam, you will enter Jannah in Salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that salam in this world and the akhirah. Barakallahu alayhi wa lakum tukhuna al-azim. Wa rafa'ni wa iyaakum fihi min al-ayat wa al-fikr al-hakim. Aqulu wa ma tasma'un. Wa astaghfiru wa al-azim wa li wa lakum nisa'i wa sallim kul jidam. Fa astaghfiru. Inna huwa wa sallam. We have five minutes for sunnah, inshaAllah.